Hi everyone, Reverend Dorr here from Faith Community Church. Welcome to our online midweek Bible study. Now this week we're going to study men and women of faith and how they confront evil in their generation. One of the greatest examples of this in the Bible is seen through the life and faith assignment of the prophet Elijah. You know, throughout its history, Israel was plagued with a list of unfaithful kings. And these kings taught the people to worship pagan gods. After the reign of Solomon, the kingdom was divided into two parts, into Israel and Judah. Now there were temple priests who came from the tribe of Levi. And Levi, remember, was one of Jacob's sons. Levi and his sons had been given the charge to serve as priests in the temple. When the kingdom split, most of these priests went to Judah. And this left a vacuum or a deficit of temple workers in Israel. So the kings of Israel would appoint new priests. And these priests who were appointed by these kings were corrupt and ineffective. Now, with no priests or kings to bring God's word to the people, God raised up prophets to cry out in order to rescue Israel from moral and spiritual bankruptcy and to confront evil practices and evil leaders. Elijah, beloved, was one of those prophets in a long line of prophets that God sent to Israel and Judah. So I'd like you tonight to please open your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 16, and we're going to begin our study of Elijah by examining the life and the history of the king that he was sent to confront. The name of this king is Ahab. Now his reign begins in 1 Kings chapter 16. I'd like us to please take a look at First uh, Kings chapter 16, verse 29. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Omri, began to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. Now the Bible tells us in First Kings chapter 16, verse 25, Omri did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did more evil than all who were before him. You know, there's an old expression that many of us have heard growing up, and that is this, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, right? Well, we've also going to learn now, we're going to learn that this expression is certainly true In the case of Ahab, the son of Omri, take a look at verse 30. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. I mean, wow, beloved, that means that Ahab was even more evil than his father Omri, who had committed more evil than anyone before him. I mean, talk about a generational curse, right? Look at verse 31. And as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, Ahab took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. Now, you may be wondering, well, what are these sins of Jeroboam? The sins of Jeroboam mentioned here, beloved, is the sin of idolatry. You see, Jeroboam created idols out of metal and worshipped these false gods rather than the Lord. Jeroboam was the first king in Israel to begin worshipping idols instead of worshipping the one true living God. Verse 32 tells us that Ahab erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. So not only did he worship this false god, he built this false god a house. 
and Ahab made an Asherah. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord than the, the God of Israel to anger than all of the kings who went before him. Can you imagine that being your legacy? That you provoked the Lord to more anger than all of your predecessors combined? Ahab, beloved, erected an altar to Baal and built this idol a house. I mean, dear Lord. Now, who was this Baal? Baal was worshipped primarily as a fertility god. And they believed that this false god would give them children. So to appease this false god, many would sacrifice their firstborn to it. Baal was also considered to be the god of the rains and of bountiful harvests. Because of Ahab, Baal worship had become widespread in Israel. Verse 33 tells us that Ahab made an Asherah. Now you may be wondering, what is this Asherah? This is referring to an object known as an Asherah pole. Now according to Canaanite mythology, Baal was the son of a chief god called El, and Asherah, who was the goddess of the sea. And Asherah pole was a tree or a pole that was used to worship this goddess. It was an abomination to the Lord. Now God commissions the prophet Elijah, the prophet Elijah, to confront the sin of idolatry that was now running rampant in Israel. You know, it's interesting to note that Elijah suddenly appears on the scene. He suddenly appears out of nowhere on the pages of the Old Testament. There's no fanfare. There's no background given. He simply identified in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1, as Elijah the Tishbite from Tishba and Gilead. Now, you need to know that this man who appeared out of nowhere in the Old Testament is given very prominent position and acknowledgement in the pages of the New Testament. He appears with Moses in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration in Luke chapter 9, verse 31 and Matthew 17, verse 3. Now, you have to understand that Moses, beloved, is identified as the greatest Old Testament prophet that ever lived. Now, you know, we have another old saying in our society, in our culture, in our generation, and that is guilt by association. How many of you heard that one? Oh, we've all heard that one, right? Well, in this case, we can say the identification of Elijah with Moses is a case of greatness by association. You see, church, there are many similarities between Elijah and Moses, who was his spiritual forefather, that are worthy to note. Number one, both men had supernatural communication with God. God manifested himself to both of these men in very unique, unusual ways. Number two, God used both of them to demonstrate his power through signs and wonders. So both of these prophets moved mightily in the miraculous. Number three, both men played a strategic role in Israel's spiritual direction. God raised them up as instruments, beloved, to deliver his word, to deliver his word to Israel in order to keep his chosen people on course with him. Now, with all of these similarities, there's one striking difference, and that is their history, their background. You see, we're given a lot of information in Scripture concerning Moses, his past, his preparation, his birth, his family, his life in Pharaoh's house, his years in the wilderness. All of this is recorded in Scripture. 
But not so with Elijah. You see, with Elijah, concerning his history and background, the scripture is silent. We have virtually no knowledge of where Elijah came from. No background information until he suddenly marches into Ahab's court in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. He lived a life of obscurity. No one had known who he was. He just appears suddenly and he appears with the power and might of God resting upon him. Now Elijah the Tishbite of Tishba in Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. This great prophet, beloved, appears on the scene out of nowhere with a mighty word from the Lord. And that word from the Lord is that there was coming a drought. There shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word, says the Lord. Now you need to understand, beloved, this proclamation was a direct hit against the false god of Baal that many believed was the god who brought the rains and the bountiful harvests. It's a direct hit to the authority of this false god, little g. Now, let's continue reading from 1 Kings chapter 17, and we're going to begin at verse 2. In verse 2, the Lord speaks to Elijah. After he gives this proclamation to Ahab, the Lord speaks to him in verse 2, and it says, And the word of the Lord came to him, Depart from here, and turn eastward, and hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. You shall drink from the brook and I, that I have commanded the ravens to re feed you there. And I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. He went and lived by the brook Cherith that is east of the Jordan. Verse 6. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. Now, the first thing that I want us to see here is that the word of the Lord came and Elijah obeyed. The word of the Lord came and Elijah obeyed. The word came and Elijah went and he did according to what the Lord had commanded him. Now, we see through this passage, beloved, that Elijah's Faith response to God is what? His obedience. Amen. Now we're going to see what we can learn about God through this very same passage of scripture. In 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 2 through 6, we see God as the one who guides and provides. In order for us to accomplish the faith assignment that God has given us, God will equip us. Where God guides, beloved, he will provide. Amen? God instructed Elijah to go to a place called Cherith. Now, this is very interesting because the word Cherith in the Hebrew means separation. God for for Elijah to fulfill his purpose was being in a season, put in a season of separation until the time of the miracle. Now, sometimes, beloved, God puts us in a season of separation before he uses us for his glory. And I know there are many of us who really struggle in this waiting period. And I want you to know that God wants every man and woman of faith to submit to his timing. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 3 tells us, For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. 
It will surely come. It will not delay. Amen. Beloved, we must learn to make peace while we're still in the waiting, realizing that our God is there. Church, he's in the waiting. He's in all things. He's right there in the middle between the now and the not yet. He was with Elijah by the brook and he is there with you. God promised Elijah to be his provider while he was in the waiting. He told Elijah in verse four, you shall drink from the brook and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. You see, beloved, God will always care for us wherever he sends us. Verse six tells us, and the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. But something happens in verse seven. It says in verse seven, and after a while, the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. Remember the word that Elijah had spoken to the, uh, to Ahab, the king. He said, there'll be no dew or rain in this land many years until I speak that word again. So the rains were stopped. And of course, naturally, eventually the brook at Cherith dried up. But I want you to know, God did not leave his man of faith abandoned. You know, there's a great lesson for men and women of faith here that when God is calling a judgment to a land, God has the means, God has the way to preserve his remnant even in the midst of the judgment. We are living in a season of judgment, beloved, and I want you to take heart. I want you to have courage. God's word to us in this hour is fear not, for God is with us even in the midst of judgment all around us right here in our nation. The judgment that is not just in this nation, but since the beginning of 2020 has literally been encompassing the entire world. God has not forsaken his people. God will not forsake you, child of God, in the midst of his judgment. God knows how to keep that which concerns him. Amen. So fear not, beloved. God has given us the kingdom and the kingdom of God is within us. So we must learn how to live by the rules of his kingdom, even in the middle of the mess that we see ourselves in. God was with Elijah by the brook. God was with Elijah when the brook dried up and God is with us right now. Amen. Verse eight goes on to tell us, then the word of the Lord came to him, arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. Now remember, God is the same God who told him to go by the brook in order for the brook and the ravens to sustain him. But now that the brook dried up because of the drought, God speaks to his man in verse eight, giving him direction to keep him in the vision, to keep him alive in the middle of the judgment. God tells him, arise and go to Zarephath. And he tells him that he's going to meet a widow there and that that widow is going to feed him. Now, through Elijah's faith journey with God, we see that God is provider. Amen. Philippians 4.19 tells us, our God shall supply all all our needs according to his riches in glory. Beloved, when the brook dried up, it was time to move on. Elijah had to go to a place unfamiliar. He had to leave what was familiar and take a step of faith toward the unknown. You see, beloved, obedience to the word of the Lord again is Elijah's faith response to God. And that obedience to that word 
was an obedience unto his own preservation. Now, you may be wondering why I keep reiterating this point. Because, beloved, you have to understand there are so many in the church who say they believe, but then they fail to obey what God has spoken. Beloved, we must learn to believe and obey. Our believing must be seen through obeying because obedience is our faith response to God. The Bible teaches faith without works is a dead faith. James chapter 2 verse 17. Faith without obedience, beloved, is null and void. Faith without obedience is the faith of a double-minded man. And the Bible warns us, let not that man, let not that woman think that they will receive anything from the Lord. Now, verse 10 in 1 Kings chapter 17 tells us, Elijah arose and went to Zarephath. And as he enters the gate of the city, he sees a widow there, just as God had spoken. And he asks her to bring him some water and a morsel of bread. In verse 12, she says to him, as the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little jug of oil. And now I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. I mean, beloved, you have to understand, God sends the man of God, the prophet of God to a woman who is preparing to die. He sends Elijah to a woman who seems to be in worse shape than he is. And he sends him to this woman, telling him, this woman is going to feed you. Now we see from this passage that God's direction from, for Elijah, let me rephrase that. What I want you to see through this passage, beloved, is that God's direction for Elijah is not only that he would be fed, but that this widow through her faith obedience to the Lord, would receive a miracle. God tells the widow in verse 13 not to fear, to go make the cake for her and her son, but first make a little cake for the prophet. Elijah tells her, make a little cake for me. We see Elijah here instructing this woman in a kingdom principle, the same principle that Jesus taught us in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, which says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all these things shall be added unto you. Amen? He then tells her what God will do as a result of her obedience. Verse 14, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends the rain upon the earth. And she went and did as Elijah said, and she and her household, she, he, meaning Elijah and her household, ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke through Elijah. Now notice what it says in verse 16. God gave this widow, beloved, her miracle. God gave this widow, who was in worse shape than Elijah, her miracle by preferring the kingdom of God first, by putting God's word first, by putting the kingdom of God first, even before her own need, God sustained her and gave her this miracle. But something very interesting happens one verse later in verse 17. She's faced with another trial. She's faced 
with another crisis, even larger than the first one, and it is the death of her son. Beloved, this teaches us something very important regarding faith, and that is this. Faith can't afford to run out. Faith in our lives must be ongoing. You see, you and I can't live on yesterday's miracle. We need faith for today. We need faith for today's struggle, for today's problem, for today's trial. The Bible tells us that faith comes by hearing. And I want you to notice that that verse is written in the present tense. It doesn't say that faith came or that faith will come. No, it says faith comes by hearing. You see, we're not talking about a faith that you had back in the day or a faith that you're anticipating will come in the future. No, beloved, this is a now faith. It is meant to keep us in the now. We need our faith in the present moment because, beloved, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Amen? Beloved, you and I must learn to live in now faith, faith that's available now. Faith that's ready now. Faith that I walk in now. Amen. Now faith comes only one way. By hearing and hearing and hearing the word of God. You see, beloved, the life that is in the word of God is meant to refuel our faith each and every day. So church, if we're going to confront evil in our generation, then men and women of faith must stay in God's word. I want to encourage you, beloved, if you haven't done so already, make the reading and studying of God's word your first priority in life. Put the word of God first. When you put the word of God first, you're putting Jesus first because the Bible says that Jesus is the word made flesh. If you want to grow close to Jesus, honey, grow close to his word. Embrace his word. Feed upon his word. It is feeding upon Jesus himself. You know, you see so many today in the church who are running here and running there to receive a personal prophecy. And many times, beloved, this proves to be a big mistake. You see, church, we must always remember that God's word is the more sure word of prophecy. God has given us everything that we need for life and for godliness written down in his word. Elijah put his word first. He put God's word first place in his life. He took the word of the Lord and he followed it. Because he obeyed God's word, the widow was blessed. And not just once, but twice. You see, after receiving the miracle of an abundant supply, verse 17 tells us that the son of this woman became ill. And we're told his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. She reached out to the prophet again. Elijah took the boy from his arms and laid him upon his own bed. The story tells us that he cried out to the Lord, interceding on the boy's behalf, pleading before the Lord for this boy's life. And verse 21 tells us, then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the Lord, oh Lord, my God, let the child's life come into him again. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah And the life of the child came into him again, and he revived. Hallelujah. 
Verse 23 tells us that Elijah took the child and delivered him from his to, delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, see, your son lives. And the woman said to Elijah, listen, now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord is in your mouth, that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. Beloved, know this. Men and women of faith know this. Signs and wonders will follow the word of God as it's preached. The Lord through the prophet Isaiah tells us in Isaiah chapter 55 verses 10 and 11. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Amen. As men and women of faith, hear me, beloved. We must speak God's word boldly and believe that the word that we speak, God's word will come to pass. In 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah receives his faith assignment to confront Ahab and the false prophets of Baal. Verse one says, after many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year saying, go show yourself to Ahab and I will send rain upon the earth. In the next several passages of scripture, we read now how Elijah defeats 450 prophets of Baal with one act from God. Look at verse 17. Verse 17 tells us, when Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, is it you, you troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you have. Oh, I love this response. He gives it right back to him. He tells him the truth. I have not troubled Israel but you have and your father's house because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. Now, therefore, send and gather all Israel to me at Mount Carmel and the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab listens. He listens to what Elijah it says, and he gathers all the people of Israel and the prophets of Baal, and he sends them to Mount Carmel. Here at Mount Carmel, God reveals his power to all of Israel. Take a look at verse 21. It says here, and Elijah came near to all the people and said, how long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. Beloved, things haven't changed much today. There are many in the church, sad to say, that are trying to have it both ways. Many compromise by trying to be in the church, but yet still be of the world. Beloved, if God is God, then we must serve him and we must stop limping between two opinions. This was Elijah's warning to the children of Israel. And this warning still rings true for us today. When confronted with these two words, notice that it says the people could not answer him. Why was that? Because the hearts of the people were divided. Elijah then instructs the prophets of Baal to build an altar and sacrifice a bull, but do not light the fire, he says. 
Elijah then proceeded to do the same thing in verse 24. You call upon the name of your God and I will call upon the name of the Lord and the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people answered, it is well spoken. So here we see Elijah puts out the challenge. Through the prophet Elijah, God establishes that he and he alone is the one true living God. The altars are set and the prophets of Baal shout out to their false God, Baal, come to us. And what happens? Nothing. Nothing happens. No fire. The the sacrifices remain untouched on the altar. And this went on, beloved, from morning till noon. And at that time, Elijah then calls out to the Lord in verse 36 saying, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God of Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Now notice what Elijah prays in verse 37. He says, answer me, O Lord, answer me that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back. I want you to see, beloved, a very important faith principle here. What is the object of Elijah's faith? Is it his reputation? No, church. You see, the object of his faith in this moment is the Lord himself that this people may know that you are God and that it is you that turns their hearts back to him. Verse 38 tells us, then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Beloved, I want you to see here, Elijah got what he was believing for because the motive of his act was the glory of God and not himself. You see, men and women of faith will receive what they are believing for when they do what they do for the glory of God. Elijah then ordered for the prophets of Baal to be seized and then slaughtered them. By the end of the chapter, God sends the rain, ending the drought. Beloved, listen, God raised up Elijah to confront evil in his generation. But confronting Ahab, hear me, was only the beginning. Chapter 19 tells us that Ahab goes home to tell his wife, all that Elijah had done. Now remember, his wife was none other than the evil false prophetess Jezebel herself. Upon hearing that Elijah had killed all of her false prophets, verse 2 of chapter 19 tells us, Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me. And more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. If I do not make your life as the life of one of them as by this time tomorrow. In other words, beloved, Jezebel here vows to kill Elijah as Elijah had killed her false prophets. Now, this word, this threat, produces great fear in God's prophet. And as a result, Elijah ran away. Now, I don't know about you, but you got to stop and wonder, you know, why? 
I mean, why would this powerful man of God, this man of faith who defeated 450 prophets of Baal and slaughtered them, now run away from the threat of this one woman? Well, the Lord goes after Elijah to ask him this very question. In 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 4, we find Elijah sitting under a tree. He's emotionally spent. He's depressed. He's filled with despair. Understand something. He had just walked away from a monumental faith journey, but now he crashes just like so many heroes of the faith in the Bible. Church, it's very important that we remember after a faith journey, after a faith assignment, we must remember that we cannot afford to let our guard down for one moment. Don't let your guard down after you receive your miracle. See, after you receive your miracle is not the time to slack off in the things of God. After you receive your miracle is not the time to stay home and not be in church. After you receive your miracle is not the time now to put the Bible on the shelf and not open and read the word of God. Now more than ever, after your miracle, we must learn. We must guard our hearts with all diligence. Why? Because the enemy knows our weaknesses. He goes about, the Bible says, like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Well, you got to make a decision. I ain't going to be one of the whom. I'm going to stick with the word of God. I'm going to keep my focus on the word. So when the enemy comes again, and trust me, beloved, he tries. We want to be armed and ready with the word of God. We want our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We want to be constantly wearing our helmet of salvation. We need to have on the breastplate of righteousness. Each and every day we have to put on Christ. We need the sword of the spirit in our hand. We need the shield of faith before us. We need the belt of truth around our loins. Amen. We need to put on Christ. Each and every day, his righteousness, his salvation, his truth, his peace. That's what it means to put on the armor of Christ, beloved. It means to put the armor of God. It means to put on Christ and everything that he wrought for us on a hill called Calvary to thousand years ago you know the devil has a short memory men and women of faith need to remind him each and every day of our position in Christ and his position under Christ's feet every day we have to remember to remind the enemy of our souls you know, beloved, hearing how this great man of faith, this great prophet faltered and had a weak and vulnerable moment, you know, kind of keeps our faith in perspective because we've all been there. We've all struggled. We've all uh, gotten sloppy in our walk of faith with the Lord. We, we've all... Um, had these moments of, of weakness and vulnerability. So these stories in the Old Testament, these stories in the New Testament, really do help us keep our own faith in perspective. You see, James chapter 5, verse 17 tells us, Elijah was a man just like us. Elijah, beloved, just like us, struggled with his feelings. He battled his emotions. He became discouraged with the ministry that God had given him. Imagine for a moment what he's feeling. In 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 4, he asked the Lord that he might die saying, It is enough now. Oh Lord, take away my life for I am no better than my father's. This is the man 
who at the word of the Lord was able to make the rain cease and at the word of the Lord was able to make the rain come again. Elijah now though is so dis dis depressed that he wants to die and God sends an angel to minister to him to bring him food and water. Now, after he rests a while, this angel instructs him to go to the mount of the Lord called Horeb. Many scholars believe this is the same mountain where God met Moses, which is known as Sinai. He goes to this holy mountain and he hides in a cave. Then God's word comes to him saying, what are you doing here? <laughs> I'm sorry, but I just love this. You know, I could relate to this so much because not for nothing, but this is how God does speak to me. You know what I'm talking about? And okay, yeah, I'm sure none of you have ever been there, right? But you have to know to me, to Reverend Dorr, this is classic God. I mean, beloved, God never pulls punches with us, does he? He asks him flat out, what are you doing here? I, I got to say, this is priceless, you know, because most of us who are honest can say we, we relate. Now, I want you to get the full understanding of what God is doing here. So we really need to read the rest of this portion of scripture in context. So take a look at 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 10. It says here in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 10, Elijah said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Verse 11 says, and he said, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind tore through the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, get this, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his faith, face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Now notice, beloved, it wasn't the earthquake or the wind, or the fire that touched Elijah's heart. It was the still, small voice of God. Elijah responds to the voice of the Lord, saying the same thing he said earlier, but now in verse 14 he says, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I, only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. You know, when he repeats himself here, you really listen to the words that Elijah is saying. You kind of get the feeling that Elijah was one of those men of God that was hoping that his faith assignment was going to produce revival. That somehow he felt more people would have turned back to the Lord, seeing the miracles of the fire and the rain. And this made him very discouraged. But in this, beloved, is a great lesson, a great faith lesson for us all. You see, in fulfilling our faith assignments, we must always remember, we are only the messengers. We are only the messengers. What happens in the heart is between God and man. 
So I want to encourage you, if you haven't seen the results, if you know you've been faithful to what God has spoken to you, you have faithfully spoken God's word to your family, your friends, those co-workers, those people around us, and you haven't yet seen the revival in their hearts, the results of the manifestation of God's word touching their hearts. I want you to remember this. In every faith assignment God gives us, in every faith assignment God gives you, you are simply the messenger. The outcome rests with him. Now, during this conversation with God, the Lord now gives Elijah three important things to do for him in verses 15 and 16. First, he tells Elijah to anoint Hazael as king over Syria. Second, he was to anoint a man named Jehu as king of Israel. And third, he was to anoint, I'm sorry, did I say, let me say that again. First, he tells Elijah to anoint Hazael as king over Syria. I might have said Israel, I can't remember. But he was to be anointed as king over Syria. Second, he was to anoint Jehu as king over Israel. And third, he was to anoint Elisha as the prophet that was going to take his place. These three leaders, beloved, history shows would cause Israel to turn away from the evil practice of worshiping Baal And they would pick up where Elijah left off. You see, through them, God brought down and brought an end to the wickedness of the reign of Ahab and Jezebel. So the important lesson to see here is ultimately Elijah's prayer was answered. But it was not answered directly through him. You see, he had a part to play, but he wasn't the end to the means. You see, God was working through other vessels, and God will always work through other vessels to get his will accomplished. So another great lesson here is this. God uses his people according to his will. The Bible teaches, beloved, that we are members of one body. Every joint supplies. And beloved, we must learn to be content with whatever portion the Lord gives us in order to carry out his will. Listen to me, bride of Christ. Listen to me, body of Christ. We are not in competition. We are members of of one body and every joint supplies. Everyone is called in their faith assignment to do the portion that God instructs them. And we are supposed to be knit together in love and unity in order to accomplish the will of God and together corporately in obedience to our faith assignments We together, whether on the platform or in the pew, are risen up in this hour to confront evil in our generation. Together, amen, with one voice. Now understand, despite all his weaknesses, God still chose to use Elijah. First, because Elijah was a man of God. The widow of Zarephath identified him as a man of God. The presence of God was upon him and the power of God flowed through him. Second, because Elijah was a man of prayer. Beloved, every major miracle associated with Elijah's life was also associated with prayer. He prayed the rain out and he prayed the rain in. Always remember this, church. God will reward openly those who meet with him in secret. In every miracle, beloved, 
Elijah pointed the people to God. And third, he was a man of God's word. Like Moses, Elijah esteemed the word of the Lord. He valued it. He honored it. He obeyed it. Now make no mistake, Elijah had many faults and weaknesses. And God used him to bring him honor and glory. God used Elijah mightily despite his weaknesses, despite his faults. Great lesson to learn from the prophet Elijah for every man and woman of faith. And that is this. If God could use Elijah to confront the evil in his generation, then God can use me. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time together in your word. We thank you, Father, for building us up in our holy faith, in our most holy faith with you, Lord God, by feasting from your word, the life stories and disciplines that we learn through these great heroes of the faith that are written in your word. Oh, Heavenly Father, that you would anoint us and give us, Lord God, the assignment that you called us to before the foundation of the world, equipping us, Lord, as you are Jehovah Jireh. We know, Father, regardless of the faith assignment you've given us, you are our provider. You are our substance. You are the one that will sustain us. You will lead us to living waters and green pastures, Father God to sustain us and keep us so that we can fulfill what you called us to do. Lord God, we know that we are in a season all around us where we see your judgment. We see your judgment against sin. We see your judgment against evil and wickedness. And Father, we thank you that as your children, we can run and hide in the cleft of the rock. We can abide under the shadow of the Almighty because we have made you the most high God, our dwelling place. Oh, Father God, we thank you that we find refuge under the shadow of your wings. But Lord, you didn't call us to run and hide. You called us to be bold. You called us to speak out, <clears throat> to give, Father, the warning to our generation to give the warning from your word, Lord God, that if we love you, we will keep your commandments, Lord. So Father, as you were boldly upon Elijah, giving him your boldness, we pray, Father, pour out your boldness upon us. Help us receive boldness in this hour, Lord God. Help us to deliver your word boldly, but with meekness of wisdom, Father God, that we show compassion and love, even to our enemies, Father, that we would have hearts of compassion, that we would compel them by the mercy and grace of God to come unto you, Lord God. Oh, Father, we pray. We pray for our nation. We pray in this hour right now, Lord God, that you will sweep and bring your righteousness that you will sweep across the land, Father, as there is still yet time. Deliver those, Lord, that will cry out to you and hear your word and heed your voice. Oh, Father, we pray for them that are yet to believe that in this hour, Lord God, bring them across our paths that we may deliver the word of truth to them, Father, that none would be lost, Father God, that we meet, that we would be the deliverers of your word, the messengers of your truth. And yes, Lord, we leave the outcome to you. We trust you with the outcome. But cause us, Father, to be faithful unto you, to bring forth your word in truth and in power. So Holy Spirit, give us that portion of the Spirit. Give us that anointing to break the yoke. Pour fresh upon us, Lord God, the outpouring of your spirit, even now. Oh, 
Holy Spirit, we open up our hearts and our minds to you. Make us the men and women that we ought to be. Change us from the inside out. Help us with our weaknesses. Help us, Lord, that we surrender our pride, our fear, our insecurity, our despair, and depression. I want to pray for those right now that through this quarantine, you have been afflicted with depression. I feel that so strong right now. So Faith Community Church, let's unite our faith right now and pray for God's release to those that are bound by a spirit of depression. In the name of Jesus, as God delivered Elijah, we pray for that spirit of depression be lifted from you in Jesus' name. In the mighty name of Jesus, we render depression over your thoughts and your mind powerless. And we speak the word of truth and we speak the word of life over you, that you would be built up in your faith and restored and made what you ought to be. Oh, Father, we pray right now for that one. Refresh them, Lord. Be with them as you were with Elijah, as their provider. Bring them hope. Bring them hope. We speak God's hope over you. You know, Christ in you, beloved, is your hope of glory. Cling to Jesus. He is your hope. He is our hope in this hour. Amen. Amen. For those of you watching that may need more prayer tonight, I want you to know our elders are here. Our elders are here to help you, to guide you, to bring you to um, that place that God wants you to be through the power of his word. So please reach out, reach out through a private message uh, on our Facebook page. You can go to our website and reach out by filling out a communication card or making a request at info at faithcc.com and send us your prayer requests. We have prayer warriors praying throughout the week and we have elders here who will minister the word of God one-on-one -on -one with you. So I want to encourage you, reach out. Don't do this walk alone. You, you weren't called to do this thing alone. Know that we're here for you and we love you. And we want to just rally alongside of you to help you become all that God predestined you to be. Amen? Amen. Well, we're so grateful for all of you who've been faithfully watching. And uh, we want you to know that we are just honored and privileged to serve you in this way. We will be meeting soon and gathering together soon in person. And uh, we just pray that you'll continue to uh, support this ministry as you faithfully have been supporting it because we are endeavoring to expand our reach both in-house and outside of the house. So we want to uh, continually advance the kingdom of God to our generation. And we just love and, and are so grateful to each and every one of you who have been faithfully supporting this ministry. For those of you who would like to give online tonight, we want to just encourage you to follow the links we provide for you. Uh, you can also text us your offering by following the number that we provide written on the screen and know that we so appreciate every gift that you're sowing into this work so that we can continue to do what God has called us together to do, which is to reach a lost and dying world by showing them that they can live the truth, they can love God, and they can, you know, affect change in one another. We can change lives together, beloved, as we love God and as we live his truth. So we want you to be a part of our mission and vision here at Faith Community Church because to us, beloved, people matter. You matter. People matter. And so we want to help encourage you to reach out to others and, and be the witness and disciple that Jesus predestined you to be. Amen? Amen. Well, don't forget, Pastor Gary will be ministering to us this Sunday at 10 a.m. Powerful word. I mean, do you just love 
our pastor. I especially love our pastor, but I know you all love our pastor too. So I just want to encourage you to come out this Sunday uh, on our Facebook page. Well, come out. I mean, you know, <laughs> you know, link in or just uh, join the, the live stream and uh, connect with us on our live stream. We want to encourage you to be a part of what we're doing, you know, uh, each and every week. So this Sunday, 10 a.m. and next Wednesday at 7.30. Don't forget this Children's Church for the Kids through Zoom on Sundays at 9 a.m. And if you'd like to know more about that, please contact Reverend Diane here at our church office and she'd be happy to send you that link so that you could join with us on Sunday with your kids. God bless you, beloved. So great to see you again. And I'm looking forward to seeing you next week. Bye-bye now.